So now we're in part nine, episode nine of God Deeds. And I don't know if it occurred to you yet, because it's just occurring to me now, just how much sin is not an issue post salvation. It's part of the cost of doing business still. You still have to name your sins to God. That gets you back online. And since you don't know if you've sinned most of the time, because sin is a thought, if you got irritated at Windows, which is my big failing, or you made a typo. Did you ever stop to think about that? If you make a typo and you don't catch it, it means that you sinned. In other words, any little thought that might seem good to you might be a sin and you won't know. If you make a typo and don't catch it, then that means you were lazy. That's a sin. Anything God wouldn't do that you do is a sin. Now, making a typo itself is not a sin because your fingers are not obeying your brain the way you would wish. And that's okay because your fingers don't have this, you know, they have this in nature in them, but your fingers are not volition. So at the moment you make a typo, that's when your volition comes into play, not before. And you look at that typo or you check for typos. Those are all volitional issues. Did you check? Did you go over what you typed to see if it was right and what you intended to say and was it good enough? what you intended to communicate will it help the reader even if the reader is you that kind of due diligence is something God will do but if we don't do it then we're doing something God wouldn't do because you know it's too much trouble okay well then that's a sin you see how many times we're really sinning and don't even know how many shortcuts we take how many times we don't actually check things out when we should? How, t- how many times we don't bother with something? It's too much hassle. And then, of course, being anal about things is the flip side of sin, where you're too, paying too much attention. And, of course, that's the problem here. Christianity is paying way too much attention to sin and not enough attention to God. Does the Bible talk about the fact we sin? Yeah. But have you ever noticed it's like only maybe 10, 20% of the text at most? What's the other 80% of the text on? God? Something he did? Something he thinks? Some story he's telling to tell you more about him? Uh Uh-oh. We're busy beating ourselves up about sin about the difference between one believer and another, between one human being and another. Oh, I'm better than you because I'm a Christian and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. Oh, well, the person who's saying that is committing the bigger sin and doesn't even know. Just like 1 John 1, 8 says, you can be walking right along and you're in the darkness and won't even know. You can be doing a good deed for somebody right in the middle of it and you'll have some thought about how good you are while you're doing it. And you just wa- started walking in the darkness and you don't even know. Because you're still doing the same thing you were doing before you walked in the darkness. So now you're in a state of sin while you do the good deed. So how much good is that deed going to really do? None. It's only good what God is in it. And that means you have to be filled with the Spirit. And that means you have to be between sins. No one being sired by God sins. Well, you're not being sired by God the minute you get all proud of whatever good deed you're doing. He's just left the building. That's what one John is trying to explain. When it says born of God, it means being sired by. It's progressive tense. Greek verb is kenao, and it means to be sired. And it's a Hebraic expression, meaning that your teacher is the one fathering you. It's a continual thing. It's a progressive thing. And the translators didn't pick up on that when they translated it. 
So there you go. So, I don't know if it dawned on you yet. It's beginning to dawn on me now. Because I'm stupider than you. This thing is so, just so not about sin. There's only one purpose to being alive post-salvation. To learn God. How well do you learn God down here? I mean, it can't be about anything else. I am hopeless, helpless, and useless. That's why I need to be saved in the first place. I am still hopeless and helpless and useless after I'm saved. My soul didn't change. I didn't suddenly become perfect. I am positionally perfect in Christ because he paid the price 2,000 years ago. That's 1 John 1, 7. Experientially, I'm going to have moments where I'm not sinning, and I'm going to have more moments when I am sinning. And that's just the way it goes. That's Romans 8. Sin nature cannot please God. As long as I'm in this body, I'm going to be sinning. That's what Paul is saying. There and in Romans 7, in 1 Corinthians 15, in Philippians 3, especially in Philippians 3, where he talks about all the good deeds he did being shit. And that's exactly the word he uses in the Greek. He calls it shit. That's the Greek swear word in those days. They've got a different pronunciation of it now. Literally means turds, plural. It's just a Bible word. Sorry. Well, that's what you do all day long, don't you? You can't even survive if you don't defecate. Yeah, well, your soul defecates too. Can't help it. Now, you can do some things to manage this disease called sin. But you can't get rid of it until you're dead. And then when you're dead, you'll be a good person. After you exit this body, you'll be a good person. Not before. Now, here's the thing about all that. The measure of the achievement and the happiness of the spiritual life is measured by the fact that as you grow to know God better via His Word, 1 John 1 9, being on your pastor, learning and living on Bible on your pastor, talking to God about what you're learning, occasionally talking to unbeliever, believers or unbelievers as the situation warrants, that's God's system. As you live in God's system, the longer you live in God's system, the more you're going to hate yourself because the more you're going to see the huge difference. Between gorgeous God and crappy you. That's why Paul says in Philippians 3 8, all the things I do are shit. That's what he says. Go look it up yourself. Except that, you know, the self righteous sinning translators cover up the word shit because, oh, you know, that's a bad word. And we're holy if we lie against the Bible and use a word that it doesn't mean, like refuse. At least the King James only version used the word dung. They were a little more honest than the other translators. Okay. So now you see a sin in translation. When you learn God more, the more you learn how He thinks, you're going to fall in love with Him. And the more you're going to hate yourself. It's inevitable. This is what Paul's talking about in Romans 7. I see my the word with my head. And I love it. And it's perfect and right and good. And then I look at what I'm doing in my body. And it's like, oh boy. He's saying the same thing in Philippians 3.8. Everything I've done for God is just blech. Shit. Only worth being flushed down a toilet. That's how the person who learns to love God thinks. Even Christ himself said to the guy who called him good teacher or something, he says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Now, of course, he was trying, part of the reason why he said it that way was that the guy who called him good teacher was obviously not yet believing in him as Messiah. And Messiah has to be God, man. So he's like testing the waters there to get the guy to recognize that he's not merely human. But as a human, as a human, 
He didn't regard himself as good even though he's perfect. See, even if you're perfect, and the better you are, the more you'll see this, even if you're perfect, you're nothing. Your perfection is finite and small compared to God's. That's why it says in Philippians 2, 5 through 10, Christ didn't count his equality with God to be of any worth. He just wanted to kill himself. It's the more you have divine standards in your head, it is true that you'll lose some sense. Sense will lose their attraction to you. But you'll pick up on other ones. And then eventually those will lose their attraction and new sins will take their place. So you do stop sending the sins you used to sin. And you pick up new ones and then gradually discard those. But you never think of yourself as a good person because you're not. You never become a good person. You never become good like God. Just like Paul says in Romans 4. If Abraham was good, he had a right to boast, but not before God. Christ never boasted before God. And he really was perfect. In his humanity, he was always perfect. He never sinned. But he didn't count it. Philippians 2, 5-10. through 10. He not only divested himself of his godness as far as using it, but he threw himself down. So, it's not about sin. It can't be about sin. There's no point to having a relationship if it is about sin. If you're spending all your life, and I, I'm guilty of this, okay? If you spend all your life thinking, oh, I sinned here, I sinned there. I mean, yeah, you've got to confess it to God, to God but it's like Paul says, you, you say it and you move on. Philippians 3, 14 and 15. 3, 3 13 and 14. I keep pressing on toward the, the goal. Okay, that's Philippians 3, 13 and 14. I'm never going to make it. My body's going to be a body of humiliation as long as I'm in it. Well, it wouldn't be humiliating if I didn't know how good God was. So that's the test. That's the importance of this. As far as the trial goes, because remember this God deeds, good deeds thing is part of Satan's strategy. He's trying to substitute good deeds for God deeds. And with good deeds, your focus is on yourself. How good you are or how bad you are. It's the same thing. If you're busy, you know, wringing your hands about how bad you are, that's self-focus. If you're busy patting yourself on the back about how good you are, that's self-focus. But God deeds is about what God does. So you get to look at him instead of yourself. And what's the point of looking at yourself except when you have to? I mean, you know, why? Okay, but that's the test that Satan failed. And that's the point of this audio. Satan could not get past the good-bad thing. That's why he invented and eventually rebelled due to his own ideas about, well, you know, the, the creature ought to be able to, you know, bring its vegetables before God and God should count that. How's God going to count that? Even before Satan sinned and he was the most beautiful and the most highly talented and the most highest of all the angels prior to the fall. Even his perfection as an angel higher than us was nothing compared to God's perfection. Do you see how it's not an issue? God is out to tell you, look, 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 look. I can going to pour myself into you. That will make you happy. I want to see you happy. I know you're not me. Of course you're not me. Is that a, uh, what do you want to call it? Um, a dichotomy? Yeah. Is that an offense? Yeah. Okay, but I like solving the offense problem by pouring myself into you. You want it? And by the way, it's a sin not to. Because if God wants it, then it's not a sin. Well, Satan didn't want it. 
That was how he sinned the first time. And he wanted to think that what he did was going to count for God. And he eventually twisted the truth in his mind to think that, oh, God isn't counting anything I do. That must be that there's something wrong with God. Because what I'm doing is good. You see how he went wrong? So we're actually accomplishing a greater good than all the world put together by not caring about the good we do. Because we're down here to play out this stupid angelic trial. I mean, it's not really stupid, but it seems kind of stupid at times. Why would Satan rebel? But we end up rebelling for the same reason he does. We want our good deeds to count. We value or disvalue other people based on the perceived good in them versus our own. You see what a shell game that is? You just tie yourself up in knots. Oh, I did a good deed today. Yeah, and you pat yourself on the back and you feel real important for all five minutes until somebody else comes along or somebody casually says something not knowing how big you are in yourself. And they mention something that somebody else did and you realize that something that somebody else did was better than you did. And so now you're deflated. That's not how God thinks of it. With God, everything is precious, no matter how low, no matter how small. And we're getting these huge rewards just because we believe Him? Just because we say yes to learning and living on Bible, which actually we are not able to do. We're able to say yes, but yes has no merit. Your aunt wills you a million dollars in her will and you say yes. Well, where's the merit? Not in your yes. It's in the aunt. With the million dollars. Okay, well, Christ accomplished the bazillion dollar inheritance for each one of us. And we just say yes when we believe in Him for salvation. We don't even know that's what happened. Yes, I believe. I don't want to go to hell. I want to be with God. Yes, I believe He paid for my sins. Okay, now you just inherited a bazillion dollars. Okay, but how much of that inheritance in Him? which is the theme of Hebrews 9. How much of that inheritance in him will actually pass through to you? Well, that's why you got to learn and live on Bible. Because it will build your ability to enjoy it once you're dead. And even while you're down here. In order to really start enjoying that inheritance. I mean... Well, actually, you start enjoying it immediately. But you don't get it all at once. It's doled out to you. Because your brain has to reform. The Holy Spirit literally has to build your brain into Christ's own thinking so you can enjoy the inheritance Christ bought for you on the cross. And to the extent you don't want to do that, well then you're not going to get it. Saved, yes. Thinking, no. It's the thinking that's the greatest advantage. It's the thinking that will make you happy. And along the way you'll get some material stuff too. You'll get it, it'll be taken away, you'll get it again, it'll be taken away again. That's happened to me several times. I'm beginning to learn the pattern of it. It's worth it. It's designed to keep you off base. Things are too good or they're too bad materially. But the biggest inheritance of all is his thinking. It's just too good to be true. It's just it's just like why God I, I keep saying this to God every day. Why am I allowed to live? This Hebrew meter thing has just got me completely flummoxed. Every time I go to, to study it or do something on it, I keep thinking, I shouldn't be allowed to know this and live. I, I'm just, every day I wake up, how come I get to know you, God? All the money on earth is not worth one pin drop of what I get to know him. Take it away, give it back to me, I don't know. I mean, yeah, my body and I are always in a conflict. But I get to know him. That happiness, that conquering of the self-loathing that comes from knowing God. See, because on the one hand, the more gorgeous you see God is, the more you end up hating everything else. Because they're not him. 
the more you appreciate the dichotomy and the, the, the horrific sacrifice that God chose to make in, in decreeing creation. And the more you wish you were never born because he has to see you live. And therefore, the more meaningful it is when you recognize his answer from scripture, which is, hi, I'm pouring myself into you. Christ in you, the confidence of glory. The Holy Spirit just threw that at me. That's uh, Colossians 1, 25-27. What's a halilo halai? Just threw that at me. That's Isaiah 54, 1. The barren will bear kids. That's not exactly what the verse says. It says something like, Shout you who never bore kids. Because the one who's ashamed will bear more kids than who are, than her who is legally married, says the Lord. That's Isaiah 54, 1, last half. That's what he likes. Filling all in all. I just threw that too. That's uh, uh, Ephesians 1, 23. He loves turning things on its head. He loves making good on the bad. Romans 8, 28, he just threw that one at me. I'm literally being interrupted. This has been happening more and more in my videos and audios lately. Usually, I, but in the past, I would like, okay, what's the verse? And then it would come. But now it's like real insistent. I have to tell you that so that you understand the vehemence with which he means what is coming out of my mouth. It's it. He's confirming it so that you know it's not just brain out making it up and you can look up the verses yourself to know I'm not making it up. This is his philosophy. This is what he likes. My big failing is that I don't, I don't access it enough. But I'm going to always be a big failure, aren't I? So we can't, we have to do what Paul says. That's what he just threw at me. Just keep, keep on keeping on. Use one John 9 keep going. Matthew 4, 4 then is always occurring. Because each moment lives to God forever. So, you got another moment that's going to live? Instead of beating yourself up about how ugly you are, or how bad you are, that's what Satan was doing. This, in our case, we get to use one John 1 9. Use one John 1 9, move on. Satan to this day could change his mind and believe in Christ, and God would accept him immediately. Why do you think this thing is taking so long? God is never willing that any should perish. He just threw that at me. Uh, 2 Peter 3 9. Never willing. Me, um, Bulete. I think it's Bulete. Never willing. May means to deny even the idea of ever being willing. Never wants. Never desires. It could be telema. It could be te tele. And I think it's bulete. Um, you'll have to look it up in Second Peter 3, 9. I forget which of the two Greek words it's using. God never desires. It's probably bulete. Okay? So, the real game here, from a trial perspective, is that happiness I was talking about in episode 8. The first thing, when you believe in Christ, but count on it, some demon boy is around you, who's going to try and hook you up with some apostate group, so you never find out the true spiritual life. So instead you get diverted into works and feeling and people emphasis. I never learned that it's just about learning how God thinks. Studying Bible. And if you're studying Bible, that's Leviticus 26 and 28. That's what blesses the world. It buys them time. It buys the world time to live. Because you're on it learning and doing the one thing God wants. Hebrews 11, 6. So see, it's not about sin. It's about learning Christ. Why doesn't Hebrews 11, 6 say... That without never without going out without sin, and it, it's impossible to please him. It's saying without belief, but it's really saying without doctrine. The Greek word pistis first means the thing believed, the object, the content. That passive meaning is what they call it in theology. The passive meaning of pistis is the first meaning of the word. It's a commercial word. It's not a religious word in the Greek. 
It's talking about the content of a contract that's on deposit by the pistas, which is the faithful person writing the contract, putting it in the temple. The idea being that you incur the wrath of the gods if you don't keep the contract. So therefore you, the beneficiary of the contract, have pistis, pistis is really what they pronounce it. Because you have the content of the contract in which to have your faith. You are receiving faith. Okay? And so therefore you have faith. You can believe in it because it's on deposit in the temple. So without faith, it is impossible to please him. Without the word in your head, believe, it's impossible to please him. Okay, well, there's no mention of sin in that verse. David sinned a lot. Moses sinned. I don't know if you can say he sinned a lot, but he sinned big sins. Paul sinned really big sins too. And they all sinned really big sins when they were mature. Okay. Paul's big sin was to want to go to Jerusalem instead of to Rome. You see that in Romans 15, Acts 18 through 22. My pastor spent three months teaching about those passages. He calls them Paul's fall. And he taught that from... Uh, April to July of 1980, 1998. I was there for part of it, but the rest of it was all, you know, recorded. And Moses' big sin was Second Meribah, when he was told to speak to the rock, and he said, and he struck it instead. What shall we bring you water out of this rock? For that, he wasn't allowed to go into the Promised Land, and that's told in Deuteronomy. And Moses starts to speak to the people, blaming them for his own sin. So he was sinning again there, too. See, God even records your sins in Scripture when you're speaking them. So, you know, obviously there's something more than sin that he wants. There's something other than sin, because he could have stopped us all from sinning. That's Satan's big complaint. Why didn't you make us step for wives, and then we'd be happy? No, because then you'd be a robot. God doesn't want robots. See? So you're doing what Satan never could do, even though you remain a sinner for the rest of your life. Hating yourself, the more you know God, the more you'll hate yourself. And the trick is, the test is, do you finally give up on the spiritual life? Do you finally give up on God because it's too hard? Because the differential between how gorgeous he is and how ugly you are is too, so great that you've got to manufacture some excuse to either flip over into some works religion that makes you feel good about yourself, which is what where most people go. 99.9% .9 of Christianity goes that way. Do you stick it out and just keep trying to learn and live on Bible? And of course, the more you do, the more you see how gorgeous he is, the more you love him, and the more you hate yourself. So how do you learn to live with hating yourself? That's your cross. That's the real cross. Like Christ said, you have to take up your cross. Well, what is it? What is, what is it really, fundamentally? Fundamentally, it's the differential between God being gorgeous and us being ugly. This whole world becomes completely unacceptable to you. Every single minute, it's like fingernails on a blackboard, even when life is nice. Because it's not him. How do you learn to live with that? Satan quit. That was his initial sin. This is why he initially sinned. The differential was too great. Gorgeous God versus, as far as, you know, compared to him, low him. And he was way higher than us. Christ should have quit the life he was given down here for the same reason. He's perfect humanity, but humanity is so much smaller than an angel. And he's got to bear sins, and yet not sin himself? How could he stand to be alive? I don't know how he got through 24-hour day. I mean, I know. I can explain it. He lived on Bible. But saying the answer... Living the answer are two different things, and yet, I'm living the answer too. I don't sin every minute on the minute. 
I, the more my focus is just on God. And the trick to this, this is why I was talking about that in episode 8. The trick is to associate. That's what Christ did. He associated every moment he breathed with scripture. So if you're doing the dishes, associate it with scripture. If you're sitting on the toilet, associate it with scripture. Figure out how. Ask God. He will give you answers because that's what he's been doing to me. Otherwise, I would have killed myself by now. You will reach a point in the spiritual life where suddenly the light bulb goes on and you realize it's only about knowing God. And God will be the only the only object of your life of great interest. Everything else is going to pale by comparison. And the minute that light bulb goes on, honey, you will hate your life. And you will not make it to the end of your life or you will try to end your life if you don't learn this trick. Learn it now. Do it now. Associate everything, every moment. Ask God, what does this have to do with you? What does this have to do with Bible class? I need to associate everything. When I go to the bathroom, when I'm in the boardroom, when I'm at the opera, when I'm buying my 16th Maserati, when I'm writing an email, when I'm yelling at windows, when I'm going to the store to buy orange juice, when I make love to my wife, when I punish my kids, when I paint the car, everything in your life associate with, learn to associate with Bible. Because that's the way you make the transition. And most importantly, then you know why God did it this way. And it's an endless source of enjoyment. But it's also an endless source of frustration and pain. He means both of them to be united together at the source. It is God who unites all perfections in himself. It's God who unites all the opposites in himself. And that's his dearest enjoyment. Because remember, the cross is never dead to omniscience. The cross is still occurring to omniscience. Every, all three of them are still on the cross because they're all three God and they're all three omniscient. The historical event of the cross ended 2,000 years ago. But to omniscience, it's still just as much alive today as it was 2,000 years ago. It was, still, it was just as much alive 2 billion years ago as it will be 2 billion years from now. How can they stand it? Inquiring minds want to know. And that for me, and you know, again, I don't know your personal details, so I have to talk about my own. But that's what keeps me going. I say to God all the time, please, I want to understand it and see it through your eyes. Because it's driving me nuts. Well, that's what he wants me to do. That's what Christ prayed for in John 17. That he just threw into my mind. That they may be one as we are one. Yeah, well, that's what I want. Otherwise, I'd rather rather never be born. Satan never got there. He never got over that hurdle. He quit. Because his own opinion of himself ended up mattering more than his opinion of God. And at some juncture, we all crossed that Rubicon. At some point in your life, God has to become more important than you, to you. And that includes, hey God, it, I, I'm a putz and it doesn't matter. He's out to conquer even your own hatred of yourself. So that stops being an issue. Like Christ said in Psalm 22, he just threw that in my mind. Psalm 22, 6, I'm a worm, not a man. He's exulting in that. Paul said, and he threw that at me, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. Hey, these don't mal, and I'd much rather boast in my weaknesses. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. That's the ultimate that Satan never passed that. God's pouring himself into me. It's up to him how satisfactory I am to him. I can't be. Can't do it. Romans 8, 1 through 10, he just threw at me. Sin nature can't obey God. Well, I'm inside the sin nature. It's in my body. It beeps my head all the time. I can't, I can't not give in to its onslaught. 
I give in to it on, you know, certain sins don't even attract me anymore. The sex thing, forget that. I gave that up when I was in my 20s. That's no longer even a temptation, at least as far as I know. I mean, the thought hits me for about two or three seconds. And, eh, no, got better things to do than that. Too much hassle. Not interested. Drug thing never hit me much. Alcohol thing, I think, hit me for a little bit. Doesn't track me now. See, you lose attraction to old sins that the world considers sins. Okay, but the the sins that the, the world commits the most are, are self-righteous religious sins. Doing good deeds. The biggest category of sins. Okay, well... You get rid of that too. But you're never immune from sin. You're never immune from temptation. So what are you going to do? Beat yourself up about it? Okay, that's what the point God's making. Look, you don't have to look at yourself. Look at me. That's what life means now. Seeing him who is invisible. Hebrews 11, he just threw that into my mind. Speaking about um, Ab- uh, Moses. I can live for that now. Now, of course, you know, my life is in my face all the time. My shortcomings and everybody else's shortcomings is in my face all the time. Okay, but it's also an occasion for asking God, how do I associate this bad thing with you? There's going to be something. Oh, well, then it's not so bad anymore. See, it was never about just bran flakes. And when the bad stuff happens, it's really not about the bad stuff. Oh, that's a training aid, too. I sprained my arm. Well, but that was definitely a training aid. All these audios came out of it. Happened at the worst possible time. I'm still reeling from the effects. So, does God not know what I need? But I got to look at him as a result. So then, wasn't it worth it to let my arm be sprained? You see, that tells me a lot about why he chooses to let certain bad things happen. If that bad thing didn't happen, there's a whole lot of insight about him I would have missed. So think about the bad stuff in your life, too. What teaching opportunity is there? You want me to learn something from this, don't you? It's not about how bad it is or how bad I am or whatever stupid things I made as mistakes. Philippians 3, 13, and 14. Just keep moving. Use 1 John 1, 9, keep moving. Because God has a lesson in it that's worth a bazillion dollars. So, now, if you had a bazillion dollars in your couch, you would knife your couch to get out that money. Okay, so if God knifes the couch to get out money for you, that he's going to enjoy forever because that moment lives forever, then why shouldn't he knife the couch? If you have to sprain your arm or lose a leg, as Christ was saying, better to enter heaven minus an arm or a leg than enter hell intact. But life is hell down here. So when it is less than intact, God's got a lesson in it. Do you want to learn? Yeah. Well, then it'll be worth it, whatever went wrong. Because he makes it worth it. He does the doing. And you get to see him. And Satan never learned that lesson. Even when he was perfect. So here you are, a little crummy you. Piece of turd you. Learning something Satan never learned. Peace out.